In the name of Jesus, oh God, have your way in this house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. How are y'all ready to worship today? Amen. How are y'all came into the house expecting God to do something in this place this morning? Brother Mitch just mentioned it. You'll just believe God can do anything in this house this morning. I don't care how big the, the trial or the circumstance may be, He can do it this morning. I promise you, if we'll just believe. Y'all worship with us this morning.
this week is uh, an important week. Our uh, kids go back to school, and this is our back to school Sunday uh, that we, we do every year. And and we want to pray over our, our children and pray over our teachers and our, our families and our staff and, and everybody that's you know going to be going back to school. Because it's not just the kids that go back to school. The kids go back to school, but then it kind of changes the the life and the outlook for the family as well, right? Things kind of change in the household. So I know some of y'all are probably relieved that they're going back to school. And, and some of y'all are like, you know, why do they have to go back? So, but um, what we're going to do at this time is um, I want some of our prayer warriors, if you consider yourself a prayer warrior, to, to come down here. And we're going to anoint the book bags uh, real quick. And I want y'all, if you don't want to come up here, that's fine. But stretch your hand towards these book bags and begin to pray for them. And then after we're done with that, we're going to say a prayer over our children as well. So y'all uh, y'all help us pray this morning.
now we're coming back to school. We want them all to come down here and kind of get in the center right here. children here at the church. Amen. Just got a couple of announcements to go over this morning. 
Uh, let's remember our ladies' ministry will be hosting their woman-to-woman -woman conference on Saturday, August 26th. Uh, please RSVP on the event website and invite your friends to come out and join us. On uh, Sunday, our Sunday school non-perishable food drive is running through Wednesday, August the 23rd. Donations will go to the Kaya House and the winning class will receive a pizza and pool party held on Sunday, September the 3rd after the service at Pastor Levi Casey's house. We'll go over our prayer request list here. Let's remember these names as we go to our Lord in prayer. Caden Williams, Michelle Stone, Diane Brundage, Kevin Gordy, Rebecca Caldwell, Mark Tucker, Tammy Cruz, Stephanie Crow, Laura Grinder, Jackson Brothers, Heather Laflamme, Linda George, James Shelton, Wayne Grizzle, Rebecca Baskin, Baskins, Claire Bingham, and Chris Yarber, all battling cancer. Pray for them and their families. Tom C. Rice in need of a lung transplant. Uh, Brian Whitley broke his neck and needs a healing. Larry Mundy fell recently and is going uh, for therapy. Tashina Miller, uh, pray for recovering over her family. Mike and Marie uh, Fowler, uh, Mike is recovering from a knee replacement surgery. Jane Patterson has several medical concerns and needs a healing in her body. Glenda and Lynn Adams, their house burned down and Glenda got burned as well. Wayne Williams needs a healing in his body. Colin Tavares, uh, not feeling well. And Cruz Fight uh, hasn't uh, been feeling well uh, for a week. And let's uh, continue to pray for Brother Emmett Compton. As, uh, as he told me just now, he is feeling better, but he still has a way to go. Uh, but it's just a blessing to see that he is able to get here to church. And, uh, and to walk and, and uh, socialize and, and so forth because uh, when you have trouble with your back uh, and Brother Wayne Williams knows best uh, it can put you down and uh, not only can it put you down it can, it can put a burden on you that uh, you know you just feel like you just can't do anything and, uh, when you're used to going and doing uh, that, that doesn't tell on you also, uh, Brother Tom Seawright, I mentioned in the need of a lung transplant, uh, had a praise report. Cindy told me yesterday that, um, that he had the drain taken out uh, last week. Thank you. 
leading us all, Lord. We just know that you're going to be there with us in everything that we do. Uh, you're going to protect our schools, Lord. But Lord, we just ask you that you just protect each and every family that's represented here this morning. Lord, that you just be with them. And Lord, I just ask you just to be with us as a remainder of this service, Lord, as the message is brought forth this morning, Lord. Lord, we just pray that the message can go outside these doors and be spread with the outside community. And Lord, I just ask you right now that you take our morning size and offerings and bless and break and multiply for the use of your kingdom as you see fit. And everybody in the house, be careful to give you all the honor and glory and praise for us. And we all said, Amen.
Y'all watch the women.
And uh, because honestly, I looked at the picture before I read what you captioned the picture with. And I said, man, that's a mean looking line. I wouldn't want to mess with him. But then Eric had put on the caption, this is what the devil sees when we start praying. And I began to think about it. We've got that power of that line. You know, we can become that thing that the devil, when, when we come around, when we begin to lift our hands and lift our praise and begin to give God the praise that He deserves, He sees that line and He begins to count. Amen. So you've got that kind of power inside of you. Whether you know it or not, it might be tracked down somewhere inside, but I'm telling you right now, it's time to activate it. It's time to flip the switch. It's time to tell the devil that he can't have our children, that he can't have our marriages, he can't have our workplaces, he can't have our homes, and there's no place there for him. See, we have the power to tell him that. Because, you know, it says in my word that God has given us the authority. He's given us that authority to speak that word in His name. And I love that. So Samson had this God-given power, just amazing strength. He killed a lion. It says at one point that he killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Now that's just by himself with this you know, jawbone of the donkey. Now I'll go ahead and tell you, it ain't a lion. But it's a lot of people. And I begin to think about this, that, you know, there's, there may be some people out here that are crazy enough that they could be in the room with a lion and not be scared. But you get a thousand people in a room and people start getting anxious. You know, anxiety is something that is a real struggle nowadays that, you know, a lot of our, our children struggle with anxiety and things like this. And, um, you know, the, the whole pandemic and stuff, it didn't help anything. Um, to me, it, it made it worse, the, the anxiety issues. But I want you to know that just as we serve a God that's got the power to defeat a lion or anything else in life, He's got the power to defeat anxiety as well. He's got the power to defeat depression. You know, a lot of times when we're, we're in the room with a, a bunch of different people, you know, it doesn't even have to be a thousand. You know, it can be, you know, just a few people. And we begin to compare ourselves to them. And we begin to look at, at them and say, you know, well, you know, I can't do the things that they do. Um, you know, they're, they're better than me. And they've, they've got more giftings. And they've got, you know, more ability. And, and I can't do that. Well, you know what? Maybe God didn't call you to do the same things that they do. You know what? He can do something great through your life all the same. You just got to believe. You got to believe that, you know what? When He created you, he created you with a purpose. That's right. See, God has a plan for your life. Each and every single one of us in here. You know, if God wanted us all to be the same, He would have made us all the same. You know, y'all ought to be praising God, y'all don't look like me. Alright? I'm just saying. I'm not the greatest person to look at. I ain't the smartest person, but you know what? I know that God can use me. And God's looking for somebody that will say, I'm willing. Send me, Lord. It doesn't matter if it's a lion or a giant or a thousand people. I know that if God's on my side, then I can do anything. So Samson had done these amazing things and, and the, the Philistines that they couldn't stand Samson. They hated him. They feared him. Because they knew that he had the power of God on his side. And they tried and tried and tried so many times to get to Samson. And they couldn't get him. They couldn't touch him. He was just too strong. How many of y'all know as strong as you might be, everybody's got a weak spot? Everybody's got a weak spot. You know, I, I almost think that it's more important to know your weak spots than it is to know your strengths sometimes. Because if you know your weak spots, you can pay attention to what's going on and you can make sure that that weak spot doesn't get hit. You know, you can put some extra covering on it. The Philistines, they figured out Samson's weak spot. 
And it was a woman named Delilah. And Delilah, they sent her in to Samson to try and figure out how he was so strong. Where his strength lied. You know, what, what his secret was. Now one thing that, that I begin to think about every time I, I look at this story is, you know, it describes Samson's hair in the Bible. You know, he's got these, these seven locks of hair. Long hair. He was told, you know, never to let a razor hit his head. But it never describes his physical attributes. And, and I would think that if Samson probably looked like Chris Hemsworth or The Rock or somebody like that, that people wouldn't be standing around scratching their heads saying, man, I wonder where his strength comes from. You know, they wouldn't be doing that. I want y'all to know, I'm just going to throw this in there. This is a little rabbit trail, but if y'all ever want to see something that will really surprise you and things like that, y'all should see a picture of my daddy back when he was like 22 years old. I did not get that, Jamie. That dude was jacked and ripped and I mean, I just, you know, he got to wear the shirts that, you know, the, the sleeves cut off like right here so you could show off the muscles, you know, so they could be popping out, you know, like pythons. If my sleeves look like that, it's just because the shirt's too small and my arms are too fat. <laughs> Let's be real. We can be real in the house, right? Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Hey, I might be big, but I'm trying to make the most of it. You know, if if he would have looked like that, they wouldn't have been trying to figure out, you know, why is he so strong? Where does his strength lie? Well, it's obvious. Look at all these muscles popping off the dude. He's got muscles on top of muscles. You know, it, it's not this big mystery. You know, he's a giant human being. I see some of these guys that, you know, that, that play football now and these, you know, the Georgia players and Tennessee players, Brother Mitch, you know, they look, they look good too. But I worked with a guy named Rico Mack that played in the NFL. And, um, and it was many years ago. How old do you think Rico is, Aaron? About 50 maybe or something? 52. All right. I'm glad she did. But this dude is just huge. I mean, he's just, he is a massive individual. I mean, he looks like he could just crush me like a pug. And I'm not small. And he makes me look small. So that's why I try to stand next to him. But he's a big guy. You know, and, and I just, I can't imagine, you know, him grabbing hold of somebody. And I, I bet he could really just, you know, just sling somebody around. I picture in my mind that, that Samson was just some ordinary looking guy. That that was what made them wonder, how is this guy doing the things that he's doing? How is he, you know, doing these, you know, incredible feats and, and you know, defeating lines and, you know, a thousand men with a jaw on him and don't mean, how's he doing all this? They just couldn't figure it out. So they sent in Delilah to try and figure out his secret. And Samson, he fell in love with Delilah. This will preach right here, but this isn't really my sermon. But it's an important part that I want you to pay attention to. Don't ever fall in love with the devil. Don't ever fall in love with whatever trick he's got, whatever trap it is. Because the thing is, is I imagine, you know, with Samson being an ordinary looking man and doing these amazing things, I imagine Delilah was pretty good looking. Now, I'm not even going to touch on who she looked like. I don't want to create an image that y'all don't need a picture this morning. But I got I to gotta imagine that she was very enticing, right? You know, it says that, you know, when the, the serpent was in the Garden of Eden, that it was 
cunning, that it was beautiful. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I ain't never seen a snake that I said, man, that's a beautiful snake. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? I ain't never looked at one of them things and said, you know, man, that's pretty. I wish I could hold it. <laughs> and on top of all that, it talks too. That freaked me out. We might have been all right if I was in the garden. I'm just saying. But that's the way the devil is, right? He'll come in and, and he'll put something in front of you. He'll just slither on in there. He'll find that weak spot. He'll work his way in because snakes, they can get into small places. You know, you think you've got a house that's snake proof? They'll find some way to get in. I promise you. That's what Delilah did. She, she just snuck right in. And Samson looked at her and he said, man, she's beautiful. You know, I, I, I want to be with her. And honestly, as strong as Samson was physically, I feel like this guy was just absolutely missing it now in some, some way. Because the lady asked him three times where his strength lied. And he told her three different stories and she tried every single one of them. And he woke up because she says, hey, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And then all of a sudden he bust out of whatever rope, whatever trap that she tried to set for him. And he bust out and he take care of the Philistines. No problem. So he was just kind of tagging her along. But I go ahead and tell you, if somebody kept on setting me up like that, you know, I, I have some questions to where their loyalty was. Am I the only one that's alone in this? Then why do we do it? Why do we do it? Why do we sit there and let the devil lie to us and put something in front of us and try and set us in traps? And you know what? We listen to him. And you know what? We make it out of the other side, but we keep on going back. We keep on going back to the same old mess, the same old junk, the same old life. And we're just hanging out with the devil. That old song back in the day, running with the devil. There, there's too many people running with him. You've got to get away from the devil. My word says to resist him. Resist him. But finally, Delilah said something in Judges 16 that honestly it really struck me because I read it the first time like the Lila was saying it but then I read it like God was saying it to us and Judges 16 and, and I don't have this on my actual notes here but I think it's verse 15 maybe don't quote me on that but go read it for yourself because I don't have time to read the whole chapter the whole story but she says how can you tell me that you love me but yet you lie to me yes. yet you you do these things that you know are just untruthful and so I read it like her but then I read it like God was saying it how can we say that we love God but we don't keep His commandments sometimes. That we're not faithful. That we're not committed. And it's because we're a selfish people. That's, that's human nature. So many times we, we don't care about you know, what, what happens, how others feel. We just worry about ourselves. Notice I'm saying the word we. I'm not saying y'all. I'm in, I'm in this boat too. I'm not perfect. There's times that I had caught myself in the middle of something and I had to take a step back and say, you know what? You're wrong. You're wrong. See, see, I need that word of rebu rebuking. I need that word of correction. 
Because I'm not always right. Casey's not in here, so I didn't hear it. Amen. <laughs> you might hear it from like back way in the nursery or something. You know, so. But I'm not. I'm, I'm not always right. Samson finally gave in. He finally gave in to, to Delilah. And it says in Judges 16, start with verse 19, if you got your Bibles with you this morning. It says, and I want you to pay attention to these words. It says, Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. How sad is that? It's extremely sad. Verse 21, it says, Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. Very sad story. But all I can think about was Samson brought it on himself because he laid in the bed with the devil. What's the old saying? You made the bed you lay in? You know, sometimes it, it, it's, not, it's not about God, you know, trying to test us. It's not about, sometimes it's not even about, you know, the devil tempting us. Sometimes we get ourselves in a, our own mess. And we want to play the blame game when all we got to do is look in the mirror. See, when they came after Samson, the first thing that they took is his vision. It says that they put his out, put out his eyes to where he couldn't see anymore. See, that's the first thing the devil wants to take from you is your vision. He wants to take your eyes off of God. And he doesn't have to physically pluck your eyes out, but what he wants to do is he wants to distract you. He wants to take your vision off of where it's supposed to be. Anybody been driving down the road before and something just caught your eye real quickly, you know? And all of a sudden you look over to the left or to the right because you see this thing that's for some reason that's distracting. And all of a sudden when your vision gets back where it's supposed to be, you're running off the road or something like that, and you have to overcorrect. Sometimes you have to get back in your lane. See, that's how accidents happen. From taking your eyes off of where they're supposed to be. Keep your eyes on God. See, if his eyes would have been on God, he'd have saw right through the law. But for some reason, he couldn't see it. The next thing that they took was his freedom. It says that they, they bound him with these bronze fetters. And I began to think that, you know, with as strong as Samson was, and as powerful as he was, I'm, I'm sure they had him bound pretty good. See, not only was Samson not able to move when he was bound, he couldn't lift his hands either. See, if we want to look at it like this, what they did was they took his worship. They took his ability to lift his hands towards God and worship. And it says after that that he became a grinder in the prison. He was a slave to the enemy. See, Samson was put in place 
to defeat the Philistines. See, the Philistines were an enemy of the children of Israel and an enemy of God. And he was put there to keep them in their rightful place and to defeat them and to protect. You know, it's really sad that he went from being somebody that did all these great things against the Philistines to where he was a slave to them. And it's really funny that what ended up happening was he began to start feeding what he was meant to be fighting. See, if he would have been more concerned with fighting off Delilah and fighting off the Philistines, then he wouldn't have got himself in this predicament. You know, I'm getting that ask myself, you know, how many times have we allowed the devil to, to cut us down? To remove us from where God had placed us and where He had purposed for us to be. You know, however many times that might be, you know, if it's, if it's happened to you before, however many it may be, I do want you to know one thing that you're still here this morning. You've still got a chance. You've still got an opportunity. And I don't believe that God makes mistakes. I believe that each and every person in this building was supposed to be here this morning. It was by what we call divine design that you were here. And I tell you what, and this has been something that since I've been pastoring that I've really, I've called on to and it, it, it makes me scratch my head. Some things make me scratch my head, you know. They make me wonder. But there's been plenty of times that, that I've seen people that, you know, used to come here or maybe they visited here for a short time and they got on fire for God and, and then just, whew, they're gone. You don't see them. And I see them out in public, and I, and I will tell you this first and foremost. I don't believe, you know, I, I'm not here to condemn or convict anybody. You know, I, I'm human just like anybody else, but, you know, I'm a big believer that, you know, I don't go to somebody and try to make them feel bad, but I do let them know that they've been missed. I let them know that we've missed seeing them, we've missed having them here. And one of the things that I hear so many times is I just got so much going on. And they'll, they'll ask me to pray for them, and I'll pray for them. But they say, I've just got so much going on, and, and once I get everything in order, I promise I'm going to come back to church. See, that's the start of it right there. See, our human nature is to try and put things in order ourselves. When if we allow God to put things in order, then they would really be in order the way that they're supposed to be. See, you, you can't wait to get good to get God. You get God to get good. That's how it works. You know, this, this story of Samson, and we're going to finish it up here in a second, but it's one of the greatest comeback stories in the Bible. It's one that really gives me inspiration. But I'm reminded of another comeback story that, that we talk about frequently here. And I guess it's just because it's so close to my heart that, that I just I, I can't get it off my mind. But that phrase that I just used there that you can't wait to get good to get God. You get God to get good. See, I'm reminded of that prodigal son. And the prodigal son, when he was at his lowest of lows, in his darkest hour, he finally decided that he was tired of being in the mess that he had put himself in. And he said, you know what? 
It's time for my comeback. It's time for my comeback. But what I want you to focus on this morning is that the prodigal son couldn't come home without the help of the father. That's the only way he could come back. It's not something that, that he could do on his own. It says in Luke 15 and 20, it says, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Notice that it, it says that he arose, which is a physical action on his part. It took action on his part. But what had to take place before the physical action was a changing of the mind. A realization of him knowing, I don't have to be stuck here. And see, when we begin to look at our problems and say, you know what? I don't have to be stuck here. I don't have to be chained to this anxiety, this depression, this addiction, this cancer, this broken marriage. I don't have to accept it. And when you finally get tired enough to get up and do something about it, I promise you, the tide's going to turn. The situation's going to change. See, we, we've got to get our mindset right if we're going to experience a comeback. We've got to get sick of being where we are right now. Because see, if, if you're fine with accepting where you are right now, then you'll never move on. But if you finally decide somewhere in your mind that you don't have to settle for this and you rise up. See, there needs to be a rising. When you rise up, great things can happen. See, we've got to get tired of being empty and defeated. I also love in this passage where it says that that he was a great way off from the Father. He was a ways away. But it said that the Father saw him from that distance. And the Father took off running to him. See, I want you to know once you turn to God, God will come and meet you where you're at. Regardless of you know, your circumstance or, or the condition that you're in, what you've done, He'll come and meet you in that place once you turn away and you decide to come back home. Aren't you glad that, that we've got a God that loves us enough, that, that He sees enough worth in us to leave the 99 and to go after the 1? You know, I, I've told you all this many times, you know, and this is in that same passage of Luke 15. I, I, I preached a message on it a while back and it's called the lost and found section. But you know what? It's hard to understand that reference when you're the 99. You might wonder, why would the shepherd leave us? But when you begin to think about, you know what? At one point in time, I was the one. I was lost in the wilderness. I had lost my vision. I had gone somewhere and couldn't find my way back home. I want you to know God will come after you. You just got to begin to make your way back home. Because He's seeking after us just like we should be seeking after Him. The problem is, is sometimes people don't want to be found. In fact, some people are hiding because they feel like what they've done is just too bad. There's no coming back from it. There's no being used after this. And they just begin to accept the lies of the devil. The lies of the enemy. I want you to know that you don't have to accept it. Because there's a God that loves you. And He wants to restore you into your right position. See, it says in this passage, it says, when the Father reached Him, it didn't say the father started telling him what a you know, dummy he was and, and how stupid he was and 
and how he was wrong, I was right, I knew you'd come back with your tail between your legs. He didn't do all that. It says that he fell on him and he kissed him. And you know what? I begin to think that, you know, that so many times, you know, we come into this house and, and maybe we've had a rough week and, you know, maybe we've made mistakes and we've, you know, we've missed the boat, so we've got failures. And when we come into this place and we, we feel unworthy to lift our hands, but that's exactly what God wants you to do, is He wants you to turn back to Him and lift your hands and say, Father, here I am. And if you want to experience that feeling of, you know, being redeemed or renewed or restored or refreshed, we need the Father to fall on this place. We need the Holy Ghost to fall in this atmosphere and change us. I begin to think about Samson and he had those locks cut off of his head. You know, it says in Job 14, 7 through 9, it says, For there is hope for a tree, if it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its tender shoots will not cease. Though its root may grow old in the earth, and its stump may die in the ground, yet at the scent of water it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. That verse right there gets me excited. Because I want you to know right now that in this verse right here, it says that, you know, that tree is cut down, but that it will sprout again. See, there's going to be a comeback. But I love here that in verse 9, it says at the scent of water. Notice it didn't say pour the water on it. It said just at the scent of it. I want you to know just a little bit of the Holy Ghost getting all over you, and man, you'll begin to bud. You'll begin to bear fruit again. See, we need a refreshing of the Holy Ghost in our life. See, we go through stuff. We get cut down. But when we draw ourselves back just close to the water, just enough for the sin of it, God will begin to turn that situation. He'll begin to take over and there'll be something that, that I love, and that's new life. There'll be new life. See, the last passage we read, read in Samson 16, it says that Samson was bound and that he became, became a grinder in the prison. But I love verse 22. It says, However, the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. I can only imagine that Samson, knowing where his strength lied, that when his head was shaved, that he felt that emptiness. But I imagine that at some point in time, that once he knew he had been defeated, because notice you can't be a grinder in the prison if they got you bound all the time. So at some point they had convinced him that he had been defeated so that he could work. I imagine what happened when Samson took his hand and rubbed it on his head and felt a little hair there. He said, you know what? God's still here. He's still with me. I can still do something. You know, it's funny to me that and sometimes this is the way that it works is that Samson's physical vision had to be taken so he could regain his spiritual vision. See, there's a lot of this stuff in our lives that, that we're focused on that's got us distracted, that God wants to get out of the way. And sometimes we can't understand why it's been taken from us, but He's trying to get our attention again. In Judges 16, 26-30, it says, Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, Let me fill the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. So they led Samson into this temple where all these people were gathered so that he could serve as entertainment for them. They wanted to 
Use him like a trophy and look at him and say, hey guys, look who we got. We got Samson. Y'all heard the stories? Y'all heard how he defeated you know, the thousand Philistines and he did this and he did that? And we got it right here. We defeated him. And so they let him in for entertainment. And it says in verse 27, it says, Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. About 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once. O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. God restored Samson's strength. God gave it back to him so that he could make this one final push and that he could fulfill his purpose. The purpose that he was born for. You know, I begin to think about that sometimes we don't understand it, but it takes that dying out on our part in order to do great things. See, Jesus said that you've got to be born again. And you can't be born again unless you die. We've got to die out to these old, defeated people that, you know, that the devil's used, that he's lied to. And we've got to understand that God wants to do something great in our life. But that's going to require us wanting to be different. Wanting to be something new. I want you to know that just like Samson had his comeback right here, I want you to know that you can have a comeback as well. It's not too late. There's still time on the clock. Don't give up. Keep on fighting. Keep on pushing towards that goal. And I want you to know that God can still do something great with your life. Just as that song said that I sang earlier, there's nothing that you've done that can't be forgiven. Yes, sir. The blood of Jesus Christ is greater than whatever you've done. And it can cover it can cover whatever it is. You're worthy. I don't care how many times the devil has told you that you're not worthy, or maybe even your family members, or sometimes even our friends tell us that we're not worthy, that we're not good enough. Stop listening to all that outside noise and focus on God. Listen to His voice. Let him draw you in. If you'll stand with me in the house this morning. As I mentioned earlier, that power that worked in Samson is in each and every single one of us. That power to to break free. And if you go back and read some more about Samson through 
you know, Judges 15 and 14, there were a lot of these times, like when Samson killed the lion, that it said the Lord, the Lord came upon Samson mightily. See, there was a move of God before there was the miracle. But sometimes, before there can be a move of God, there's got to be a move from us. We've got to move out from wherever it is that we're stuck. And we've got to understand that we don't have to be scared. Psalms 46, 1 through 3, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its water roar and be troubled. So the mountains shake with its swelling. You don't have to be afraid anymore. See, the devil wants to instill fear into you. But God, He wants to fill you with power. And he wants to fill you with purpose. And I want you to know that once you've got a desire for that power and purpose to take presence in your life, You know, it talks about in 1 Peter that the devil, he moves around like a roaring lion. You're going to become that lion. You're, you're going to have that roar that drives fear into him. See, God, he never intended for us to be a defeated people. He never intended us to for us to have fear. And the last verse I want to leave you with, and I hope this encourages you this morning, is Joshua 1 and 9. It says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. That word dismayed. Don't be fooled. Don't let the devil trick you. It says, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Whatever you got going on this morning, whatever you're facing, whatever you struggle with, I want you to know that God's ready to let your comeback take place. But it's going to start with us not giving up. And it's going to start with us making that move back towards Him. I can feel in my spirit that there's some, some real needs in the house this morning. And I want you to know that if you'll have that same kind of courage that Samson had to make that one final prayer or that courage that the prodigal son had to say, you know what? I don't have to be stuck here anymore. And just like he moved on from that place, if you'll move on from wherever you're at and come down to this altar and lay whatever it is down at God's feet, he'll begin to do a work inside of you. And he'll restore that strength. He'll restore that desire and that passion to live for Him. He's got what we need this morning. Just like it talked about that that tree began to bud at the scent of water. I want you to know that our God is like a well of living water. And if we'll draw, draw close to Him, He'll do something great inside of us. Let's pray this morning. Dear God, we just thank you for your word. God, I thank you for what you're about to do in this house right now. God, I pray that, that you would just give us, dear Lord, the courage to lay whatever it is down at your feet. God, I pray that you would just begin to move in hearts and minds right now. And God, I pray that not one single person, dear Lord, will leave this house 
God, with any kind of weight or burden that they came in here with, prick our hearts this morning, dear God. Jesus, we need to move from you in this place. God, fall on us this morning. And God, we thank you for what you're about to do in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. These altars are open, friend. We love to pray with you this morning. Don't let the devil lie to you this morning. Just make that step back towards the Father.